I don't know if anybody said amen to that. It's just weather. I have my winter voice today. Yes? yes. yes somehow, some way, those things kind of change a little bit over the course of the seasons. And so that's, I guess, normal. My mom taught me that a long time ago. This morning, as you're uh, uh, preparing and getting ready, go to Acts chapter number 2. I'm going to be there. Then I'm going to mention Acts 3. Then go to Acts 4 and talk about our expectation of the year. I know that um, a lot of people, of course, are out and different people are uh, sick, ill, or traveling, or finishing up, and it's Happy New Year, and finishing up with their holiday time, and so very, very thankful, and uh, uh, I turned the heat up for second service. Um, there was a few grumbles, so I'm glad, Doc, you took off your coat. That's a good sign, praise the Lord. You know, we, you know, we got to the, we hadn't tried our heat yet, so we tried it, and it was a little bit cold, so turned the heat on a little bit, that helps, but uh, this morning I want to uh, just walk through um, again, who we are, what we're about as a church, and a, a reinforcement, a reminder and a reinforcement, and uh, our Acts 2 project and what the mission of an Acts 1 8 church is, and our Acts 2 project that we looked at um, yeah, probably 14 months ago in November, December of 2020, the beginning of 2021, and looked at your expectation and what does God expect out of us together. And what does God expect out of us individually? Each one of you, I hope, has a copy of our handout. Is there anyone that was not able to get one, would like one? Would you raise your hand real quick? We'll make sure that you get one. And uh, you'll be all set. Awesome. Awesome. So I guess we're all set. But I'm going to get into that here in a little bit. But I want to just kind of, again, reinforce uh, maybe remind a little bit and have memories brought back of we went through a study in the book of Acts, gosh it's got to be two or three years ago, the Acts of the Apostles, we went through that and uh, Jesus and his church and God really showed us again what a church ought to be and more so you know in your uh, Bible reading, Bible study and you can be part of so many Bible studies here, we have taught the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles in our Bible Institute courses um, and that will be coming back again in a couple semesters. We have our Bible Institute starting up at the end of this month. And, and there's opportunities to learn the Word of God, and this is just one of them, preaching and teaching the Word of God. Next Sunday, I'll be back to Ecclesiastes. We'll be in chapter number 6 and going through our study of uh, search out everything or search, search for purpose and everything, and that's what we want to do. Today, again, is you know, the kickoff of the year. And uh, the biggest thing about this coming year is our 25th anniversary. And the undergirding of all of that is very important in what God put upon us last year. Live faith, love others, declare hope. We found that to be really a big step in the beginning of last year, saying, hey, this is how missions and family and sports is going to be personified and lived out is through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and how we live our faith out to others. We love others as uh, we ought to and uh, as, as ourselves and then declare hope, the, the glory of the Lord and what the church is supposed to do collectively. When you see that artwork up there, Acts 2 Project, you're reminded of what this early church was all about. It was comprised of fervent believers that believed in prayer they believed in extolling the name of Jesus. They believed in the gospel, the preaching, the resurrection of Christ. They believed in, hey church, they believed in doing what we're to do in such a way that, you know, you and I are almost spoiled, safe to say, is that we have Bibles on our laps. We have a complete copy of the Word of God. It's nothing to be added or taken away. It sits on our laps or in our electronic uh, uh, devices and and what they had is they had the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had the words of Christ. The apostles were declaring the word and they were getting it done. And as we pick up Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 41, we are reminded again in this Acts 2 project of what was going on here. That these 
people that were responding were pricked in their hearts at the gospel message of Peter preaching. And, and of course, there were people that got saved. And verse number 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. What a great thought that after someone gets saved, they get baptized. That's not such a difficult thought, but somehow we, we see young people get saved. and or, or the, Well, there's not a lot of praying going on here. A young person or an older person or someone much older, whatever age, when they gladly received his word, they should be baptized. Maybe this year you've been putting off, you've been saved, born again, you called on the name of the Lord to save you, you know you're a child of God, you've been reading the Bible a little bit, but you've never been uh, scripturally baptized. This is the year. Be baptized. Get it done. Get it taken care of. They said, and the scripture says that they gladly received as were baptized. And the same day, it says in verse 41, the second half, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's, that's beautiful. Well, that was back then, and that's this now, and I don't know how that could happen, and that's going to happen in some other part of the world. I, we have dummied down the gospel so much in a way that we don't believe God could do it, or we don't trust God enough. I was listening to this phraseology from a pastor friend the other day, and he said, I hear people so often telling me that they're trying to do things and trying, and I, I've just told my people at church, you don't need to be in a place of trying, you need to be in a place of trusting. We need to trust the Lord. Not in the, I'm trying, how about I'm trusting, and God will fulfill it. It may not happen this week, this month, but to trust, trusting in him. Verse 42 continues, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. A powerful verse right there. Steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. What did they look up? They repeated the doctrine that Jesus Christ taught. The doctrine for the church. The doctrine for the believer. They, they taught, very simply, be saved in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be scripturally baptized. Be baptized according to his command. And then understand who the Holy Spirit of God is. Understand what the church is about, and they're learning because they're telling you what the church is about. What did they do? They were in fellowship. That means like-minded believers are going to hang out together, breaking a bed in prayers. They're going to get together to do the Lord's Supper. They're going to get together to do prayers. They're also going to get together just to have fellowship and break bread in other ways and not to pervert the two and intermingle. If it's the Lord's Supper, it's the Lord's Supper. The church of Corinth had to learn this. They were turning it into a perverted way of going about the Lord's Supper because they turned it into some big food fest and some big drink fest. No, breaking of bread in fellowship is one thing. Breaking of bread in prayers and going to the Lord's Supper is another thing. And so they knew what the early church was to be doing. You see so much this cover. Verse 43, fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, all the Jews that were around Jerusalem at the feast time. They were hearing this message, <coughs> and they were thinking, okay, what is it that's going on here? Well, <coughs> that's what happens when you talk too much. The apostles had this incredible ability to do wonders. They had the signs that they were able to carry out, and the Jews were responding and the Jews are looking and saying, wait a minute, yeah, we require a sign. And those apostolic powers pointed to people saying, this is Jesus. This is the name of Jesus. This is who he is. This is for Jesus Christ. And all that believe were together and all things common, verse 44, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Again, think about this real simply. And some of you do this. Some of you already saying, hey, what can I do to help somebody? Well, I'll sell this, I'll sell that, I'll get rid of this, I'll get rid of that, I'll do this, I'll do that, and I'll go bless somebody. You don't even have to have permission from the pastor to do that. You don't have to have permission from your ministry leader to do that. You can sell things that you have and decide to give it all away. You say, ah, I'm going to give my possessions away. You don't have to give it to the church for a tax right off. That's fine if you do. It's saying very simply how much they believed in the fellowship, the body of Christ, the intermingling, the intertwining of the word of God, the spirit of God. And they said, it says there, had all things common. 
than our theme verses of the Acts 2 project in verses 46 and 47. They continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily as should, should be saved. I'm wondering if after reading the Bible so many times or having a message preached out of the same text many times or hearing a reinforcement that the words that are being spoken, maybe they just roll off of our ears or maybe we don't realize what Christ is really saying here. That when they were with one mind and one accord with one passion, that they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and house to house. What does it mean to continue daily? To adhere to one. To be devoted or constant to one. To be steadfastly attentive unto and give unremitted care to a thing. What is that like for us? I think sometimes, again, the scriptures are meaningful to us and extra meaningful when we're going through a certain period of time where, of course, the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the word. But I'm of the belief, no matter where you go or wherever you're at or in your devotion time in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, or in a Bible study or an institute course or, or any place in a small group, when you open up the Word of God, it's going to speak to you. <coughs> Let me get a drink real quick. <coughs> I talk too much. <coughs> ah, <that was> good. <coughs> but when the Word of God is taught... When the word of God is put before you, do you have a place where in the common time in the temple, in the common time house to house, is there this gladness and singleness of heart? There's so many things that have us off point. There's so many things that are taking away from that unified one accord in the temple that unified one accord house to house. When you and I think of, again, this Acts 2 project, and hey, Pastor, I know you put that out there last year as a refreshed and renewed vision of the Acts 1-8 church mission. What were you after? And Well, we were after a little bit more, a little bit healthier in some areas that our missions on Sunday that we did four different times, we're gonna do those again this year, put missions in front of our church even more so on Sunday mornings. That we had our young adults group getting together on Tuesday evenings now is going to become a Sunday morning young families and a Tuesday evening just young singles. As God has increased our leadership and the strengthening of that, we're able to do more in Bible studies, more in small groups, more in our institute, but we also are getting more of you involved in the place of missions, giving to missions, going on mission trips, praying for missionaries. It's neat to see seven, eight, nine people praying for missionaries every Saturday morning. You want to join? They have plenty of room in the cafe. There's about 800, no, 700 square feet in the cafe. There's five tables with six chairs, even more room for you to come in there at 8 o'clock in the morning on Sundays and pray for missionaries to get together on Saturday mornings and pray together with a bunch of men at 7 a.m. in the coffee house. We'll start back up this Saturday. You see, when they continued daily with one accord in the temple, that was the gathering place that they have. It was the place in the temple. It's a sacred place. We know that we're the temple of the Holy Ghost, but this building... Is an edifice that God set apart for us. And as we have said before, this was a place, even Peter and John went up together in the temple. It says in Acts 3.1, at the house of prayer being the ninth hour. That temple, when Jerusalem had 
so many different pieces and parts, the sanctuary courts, the precincts, the different places of the buildings, and that's where they gathered, balconies, porticos, all those type of places, the stairs, the steps, and the Gentiles would come to see what the Jews were doing in their worship of this God. And even the Gentiles came to hear the word of God being preached as much as the Jews did. And of course it was looked at as this holy place, this sanctuary. It's a neat place to come. It's really good to come to church, to come to the temple gathering. And we know that we have a unified spirit getting together in different gatherings, but especially in our worship service. And then you have a house-to-house thinking, breaking bread, house-to-house. And again, it's part of what the church is supposed to be doing. The whole principle, Acts 5, verse 42, if you want to turn there, I'll just read it. Very simply says this, and in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. It was in the temple and in every house. When you look at Peter's accounting in Acts 11 of what God took him through in going to Cornelius' place. You realize that he's accounting for going to some man's house and that the house came to know the Lord. And you see where all these things happen at somebody's house, house to house. There's verse upon verse upon verse on the house in Acts 16. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Of course, that's in Philippi when we see the story of Lydia, a seller of purple, coming to know the Lord. She was baptized in her household. You see, things happen in the temple. Things happen house to house. That's the Acts 2 project that we're in the middle of, everybody, to live faith to love others, and to declare hope. We said we would refine our mission last year. We said we would do that. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3, and I believe that God has shown us that we have been in the midst of doing that. When we went to 1 Thessalonians last year, chapter number 1, we went through and saw this model church in Thessalonica. When you look at the handout... It says right on the front, live faith, love others, declare hope. How do you get unified? Everything has to be put out in front of you. How do you get unified? The people that hear it and receive it must buy in together. There has to be a sense of loyalty and camaraderie and unity and When we have that together, it's beautiful. It really is. And things are accomplished. 1 Thessalonians 1.3, as again, this letter is being written to a model church. It says in verse number 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always. For you all making mention of you in our prayers. Again, the church prays together. The church gets together and has this common heart together. Verse 3, remembering without ceasing what? Your work of love, your labor, excuse me, your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing brethren... Beloved, your election of God. Once you got saved, you became one of the elect of God. When you called in the name of the Lord, the Lord then said, I have something for you, church. I've set something apart for you to be my bride, to be the body of Christ. And I want to work through you in your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope. So, what does it really simply say? Live faith. We did a series out of Galatians. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. It says, of course, in Romans 5, as much as I quoted Galatians 2.20 and Romans 10.17, Romans 5.1 says, Therefore being justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2 says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of his glory. I'm thinking, okay, the glory of God. I'm thinking to live faith takes more than just reading a Bible verse. Though I understand that reading the Bible will make my faith stronger, there will be more to my faith. But I'm to live faith, which means that as the essentials of knowing what our salvation is about, faith is one of them and love is another. To love others is another essence of our salvation. It's real to people. It's actually evidence of faith. It's actually very simply the fruit that's in our lives to love others. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, as says here in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. We know that the love of God found in 1 John 4 is because he first loved us. Here in his love, 1 John 4, 7, 4, 9. Not that we love God, but that the, he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. We have known and believed the love that God had to us. You can look at 1 John 4, and I believe love is mentioned over 20 times in that one chapter, starting in verse number 7. To love others. We're to love others as we love ourselves. And then we're to declare hope. The hope of our salvation, another one of the ingredients that shows people the essence of our salvation. We know that we're truly saved by the hope that we have that one day we'll be with Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter number 8, verse 20, And the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same to hope. Verse 24 and 25 in Romans 8 says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But do we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. What is hope if you can see something? <laughs> then the creature that says, oh, I can see that, then I'm waiting on the Lord because in the word of God it teaches me in the hope of my salvation that I can wait on him and see that I one day will see him even if I have not seen him, which I have not yet. We are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Very simply, everybody, what is it that people see in you and see in me that would make them think that we live by hope? Because that opens the door to declare hope for someone to hope in Jesus Christ. Oh, it looks hopeless. It looks meaningless. It looks like there's just no way, no how we're going to make it. What about your faith? What about your love? What about your hope? Your expectation. That's what we put before everybody last January. Your expectation, my expectation. What is it for you and me? Your expectation this year was to live faith, love others, declare hope. Now, right now, looking back on your year, was your year like that? Did you live faithless, love self, and declare hopelessness? Did you grab a handle on what God had and said, I'm going to live my life by faith. I'm going to love others as I love myself. I'm going to fulfill what God commanded in his word. I'm going to declare hope to people because I'm going to live my life in hope. That's your expectation as we were refining and glorifying. We were glorifying God through the Acts 1-8 church mission, through missions and family and sports all year long. That's what we did. And I wanted to just reinforce that this year to have you say as we move to what we were ing we're going to declare what we ought to do again this year in our 25th anniversary because this is really, really important to our church. This is really important to the history, the present day, and the future. Where we've been, where we are at now, and where we are going. 
And it is important, as I've said before, to remember what God has done. In refining the mission, we also spend time glorifying, glorifying God. And as we refine the mission and glorify God, we know that live faith, love others, declare hope is what we're about. Everybody has one of these in front of them. And it has, again, the artwork of what I presented to you the first week of May. First week of May was eight, eight months ago. Four months from today, we'll be on the sports park for our 25th anniversary celebration. That's hard to really conceive sometimes because time moves so fast. But as, again, we spent time last year glorifying God and refining the mission and knowing that we're in the midst of something that is really, really of God and giving, again, glory to God, we look at our 25th anniversary and think, okay, what are we going to do this year? We're going to put a lot of focus right here, the 25 years of God's favor. We don't want to add so many things or take away from anything that God has done. Our weekly offerings are really very similar, but there is something that we're adding. When you look at the 9 a.m. Sunday morning service, of course, our worship, our investors will be gathering together in their class on the south side of the Fellowship Hall next Sunday. The young families will be gathering in the Fellowship Hall at 9 a.m. And if you look inside here, yeah, okay, what does it say in there, young families? Okay, so about Sunday groups. These gathering times give adults an opportunity to grow deeper in relationship with one another, and there's an explanation of the four different ones. Young families gear into our 20s and 30s as they embark on growing a healthy family, meet in the fellowship hall. That will be going on at 9 a.m. Pastor Dwayne and Pastor Randy will be leading that with their wives, and uh, really it's going to be a tremendous time of taking what we have already got going and kind of giving it a little bit more of a strategic focus on just those young families. Sunday morning will continue, of course, on the calendar there and up on the screen with Faith Place Sunday School with the kids, of course, and Discipleship Hour. That kicks up again next Sunday. And then at 1030, our 1030 worship service, of course, and then our prime youth group, our junior high and high school, will be meeting over in the fellowship hall like they have been doing in the of course, the divider will already be up. The Faith Place Church, they'll be getting together. And so that the kids have two different settings where they learn in a Sunday school setting and they learn in a little bit of a church setting if they're here for both services or if the parents choose to be at one or the other. Then, of course, our Sunday groups, the 40s and 50s meet at 1030, led by Rick Adams and Mike Meyer and their wives and their time of getting in the Bible and fellowship for the 40s and 50s. Tuesday evenings are going to continue. It will be more put upon just the singles. It will be 18 to 25 young single people. And it will be uh, spearheaded and, and overseen by Brian and Tammy Calloway as God allows us to move the young families over to our Sunday mornings. It will still be their special time. Then we'll have Wednesday evenings, still have our Bible study for our investors and our youth group. You can see a little bit of a change. It's moved to 6.30 so everybody can get home a little bit sooner. So our studies will start at 6.30 on Wednesday nights as we start our Bible Institute times at 6.30 every night when we have Bible Institute. Of course, we use Thursdays for different times of the year when the girls and the guys have different Bible studies. But then you go to Saturday mornings and we have our men's ministry prayer time, 7 a.m. Guys, you want to pray? We're here. And at different times, I know maybe you can't make all of them, but see if you can put it on your calendar for a commitment to say, hey, I'm going to come up and pray with a bunch of guys at 7 o'clock on Saturday mornings. And we're able to get done if we have ADP sports done by 8 o'clock easily to be able to get on the fields to minister to people through sports. So when you look at our calendar and our time of weekly offerings, you say, hey, according to our holy calling and our Acts 1-8 vision, Acts, excuse me, Acts 1A uh, Missions Conference and our time that we spent talking about a holy calling, that's kind of that theme that we're taking throughout the year on our Sunday mornings. Of course, then you have your calendar. And your calendar has its first thing that's right on the back, right at the top. That's our 
anniversary celebration week. Our anniversary celebration week is May 1, May 4, and May 8th. And it has all three, all three things that are there. You see them right on your, on your handout right there. The first is ADP Sports Park. And we're going to start at 10 o'clock, go 10 to noon. And then, of course, we're going to go uh, Wednesday evening. It'll be a special time. It'll be our 25th anniversary praise and prayer service. We'll have some testimonies that night. 6.30 on Wednesday, May 4th. That actually is the day that the church was commissioned and set out. So that's the real anniversary day is May 4th, 4-4, excuse me, 5-4. And then we're going to be uh, having a challenge service, which is a Sunday after the celebration that week of our Sunday morning challenge for the rest of the next 25 years. So celebration of what God has done, celebration of where we're at now, and a celebration of where God wants to take us that whole week long. Again, now, very simply, I just want to give you an overview of each one of the months as we live faith, love others, and declare hope. January. Very simple. Just go right through them. January, we had the celebration of life with uh, Resource Health, formerly Rachel House. We'll start our baby bottle drive that Sunday. Uh, our own Lano Yule will be speaking. She continues to work in that ministry and is involved and knows what's going on a great deal. I want to share a little bit of mission and vision that morning. Uh, missions on Sunday morning uh, will be the 30th. It's the first, fifth Sunday of the year. Pastor Randy will be sharing a little bit of what's going on in missions for all of you. So you'll know right up in front, some of you are able to make the Acts 1A conference, some of you are not. But he's going to give a complete report on where we're at with our missionaries. Of course, the 31st is when our spring semester starts with our Acts 1A Bible Institute. And on you go. February, of course, is our dinner theater. It's an outreach into the community. And we hope to be able to, through salt and light, invite a bunch of people to come. Weather permitting, of course, uh, ADP Sports Ministering Hearts Breakfast is when we get all those that are volunteers together, kind of celebrate what God did last year and invoke new people to come into that ministry and be part of it. Co-ed volleyball then will start on the 20th of February. March brings our men's conference and ministry fair. We haven't had one in a while. We are planning it again, see if we can get it in on our March calendar. April is our women's conference. Of course, we now know that uh, our spring is Happy Five Soccer, and so that'll get kicked off in April. And then Resurrection Sunday is the 17th of April this year. May brings, of course, our big celebration week, which we already talked about. Our senior recognition, our men's softball getting kicked off, and missions on Sunday. Our second one, June, July, our summer's here. Somehow we miss, but if you open up and look... Vacation Bible Sports Camp, June 6, 7, uh, excuse me, June 7 through 10. That is a big, big week for us. Uh, one of our regional mission outreaches, of course, our baby, baby dedication, Mighty Might Starts. July, summer camp. They're going to be doing it that first full week of July. It says on your handout, the 3rd through the 9th, just to cover all the dates, Pastor Josh and uh, some of his trusty assistants in the servant team are working through putting that camp together. They're going to somewhere new this year, and it's coming together beautifully. You will not be disappointed, moms and dads. Make sure when you see the information coming out in the next month or two to get in on that. It's going to be a great, great camp, and Josh is putting that together right now. That is, of course, a dead week in the state of Missouri, so they're using that opportunity to maybe increase the percentage of people that can come. We know Vacation sit, you can never hit everybody, but he is uh, desire, desiring to set something that is on the calendar every year in the same time after the last couple of years of craziness. Our Give Thanks picnic in July, our missions on Sunday, our third one at the end of July, our third, fifth Sunday. And then, of course, August, September brings the fall, a charity golf tournament, our co-ed softball, peewee football starts up in September. Our Bible Institute for the fall semester starts up. And then the last quarter of the year is here, and you go, oh, my goodness. <coughs> How did we get here? And then, of course, the Acts 1A conference. We'll be here before you know it, when we were just there. 
this seems like 15 minutes ago. Family Field Day, our outreach, our last missions on Sunday. And then, of course, as we take November and look back on all that God has done, our Christmas production in December. You say, well, there's a lot of similar things there. Well, on purpose. As I said earlier, as you go to Acts chapter number 4, and I'll finish up. Acts chapter number 4. That our next steps behoove us to really see the heart, the operational system of the early church. And how really, again, as I have, again, I mentioned four years ago, I spoke on this passage because we were in the Acts of the Apostles study and spoke a little bit about one heart and one soul. I want you to think about our next steps in the Acts 1-8 project and how we would see what's expected of us. We said, hey, your expectation, well, I just kind of reworded it. What is expected of us? What is expected of us? What does God expect from the church? What does God expect of us? Pick up with me in verse 31 of chapter number 4, and we'll see what God expects out of us in our next steps Think of the context. Peter and Paul have been laid hold on because they healed someone. They've been preaching the gospel. The scribes and the Pharisees, they don't want them to be speaking about this Jesus. They want them to stop, 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 stop. They said, well, we'll just stop them. We'll tell them they can't speak of Jesus Christ anymore. And we'll release them, which, of course, didn't go well in the middle of chapter number 4. And Peter and John, it says in verse number 19 of chapter 4, Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They continued to be witnesses. They continued to be these preachers of righteousness, and people got saved, and they continued, and the early church continued to grow and to thrive. They led people to Christ. They were teaching them the doctrine. They were discipling them. They were planting more and more churches and more and more gatherings, house to house, in the temple. And then you arrive at verse number 31, and what do you see? And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Sounds familiar from Acts chapter number 2. In verse 33, and it said, With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. You see a couple of highlighted principles there. It says there that there was a one heart and a one soul. One heart and one soul. What's expected of us? What is expected of you and me? What do we see from the scriptures very simply in the Acts 2 project for us to come forward and say, okay, God, what would you have me to do? We need to see how these guys came alive because the church came alive in the book of Acts. If you look at that context and see what was going on there, they were not going to be deterred from preaching the gospel. They were held back. They, they were told and commanded, hey, don't you talk about Jesus anymore. Ha. We're going to threaten you. You better not speak about him anymore. Didn't stop them. Didn't stop them. They prayed. The place was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spake the word of God with boldness. Now, those are some unifying, come-together principles we could all agree on. Speak the word of God with boldness. Be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Have one heart and one soul. And you and I... What, what does God expect out of me? What, what does he, he expects this. Well, it was just for the apostles back then. No, he expects it from you and from me. We have nothing less than what they had. In fact, we have even more. They had a mini version of what the word of God had to say. They had enough. 
but they didn't have what you have on your laps right there. We have the word of God. We have the words that Christ has spoken. We have the doctrine. We have the truth. We have the ability to pray. We have the ability to say, okay, God, unify my heart where the seat and center of my will and decisions and my personal ways Unify that with the one soul, the one heart and one soul where the seat and center of my feelings and desires and affections that affect my will are put together. And so my desire is Jesus. My emotions are drawn toward a love for him, for all that he's done for me. My feelings then for my soul move to a place of my heart and my will where I'm thinking, okay, okay, okay. You know what? I can't take a step out to pray a little more. I can't seek your face over matters. I can find somebody to be in one accord with. And so my carnal life that I could live as a born-again Christian, I could live in my carnal, or I could live in my natural state if I'm lost, and so I'm still unredeemed, or I can live in that spirit place. Whereas it says in 1 Corinthians 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but unto carnal, as unto babes in Christ. If I put on that spirit side and say, I'm going to be one heart, one soul, then it opens up this door for this great grace, this great power, this great work of God that can happen in my life. How is it that great grace and great power are not seen by us that much? We should be able to live in that place of going, wow, look at verse 33. When they spoke of the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ raising from the dead, there was great power. And they realized in that moment God's great grace was upon them. You say, I haven't really had great power or great grace well, have you taken the chance, the, the opportunity to live by faith to declare that hope in such a way? Every one of us who has said, okay, God, you expected me to be of one heart and one soul and really be part of this great grace and great power. Every time we have jumped in by the word of God, by the doctrine, by the witness, by everything that the Holy Spirit of God says that he will do by his word, by the word of God, We fulfill the expectations of God. What is God expecting of us? What does he want from us? Does God look forward to us doing more? Yes. Does God look forward to us, though, more importantly, being more like his son, Jesus Christ? Yes. He wants us to know him and the power of his resurrection. What is expected of us as a church in our celebration of 25 years? I sure hope when you look back at all of God's favor for 25 years or three years you've been here, five years or 10 years, you go, wow, thank you, God. Thank you, God. I expect more from you, God, as we live faith, love others, and declare hope. You see, We know that I had the ING at the end of this earlier. Now I simply take away the ING and say, what God expects from us is to glorify God right now, in this moment. Yeah, last year we did that, but we can't live on last year. We remember what God did. That should spur us on to say, okay, today I make a decision that I'm going to give glory to God. I'm going to glorify God through the Acts 1-8 church mission. What is that? I covered it. Acts 1 8, Acts 2 46, Acts 4. This model right here moves as the church of Jerusalem does what they do. They stagnate a bit. God has to split up the whole band, He has to split them all up. They reject the Holy Spirit of God, they reject Jesus Christ. Israel rejects God the Father. They reject them all as they stone Stephen. And God says, okay, the message is going to go to the Gentiles. Stoning of Stephen's done, and the church has to go and get out there. Okay, believers, go. So you're going to have to glorify me through the Acts 1-8 church mission that I planned for you from the very beginning when I spoke my last words to you before I went to my father. And then you may have to refine the mission. 
Well, that's what happens. They went off to Antioch and got a whole lot of things done in Antioch. They evangelized. They discipled. They planted some churches. And they continued and continued and continued to refine the mission of the Acts 2 project. To live faith, to love others, and declare hope. It's in the Bible. The early model continued. God refined the mission through the people. And as it says, separate me, the Holy Ghost did, Barnabas and Saul, and they were sent off in Acts 13. Down the way they went to refine the mission of the Acts 2 project that those people had house to house in the temple continuing daily, one accord, gladness and singleness of heart. Whew. So what does God expect of you? That was all us, we, ours. That's safer. It was what does God expect of you, of me? Well, the collective question is a lot easier, Pastor. Yeah, but we're in it together. It's when it becomes specific. Because each one of these words that are written in your Bible are meant for you personally, meant for me personally, and they're meant for the church to read when it comes to the letters that are written to the church. And as we know in those places where we see beautiful things like the church at Thessalonica, wow. Whew, their work of faith, their labor of love. Wow, their hope. The hope of their salvation. They showed us the model. May we continue to be the model church that God has called us to be. Let us pray for our invitation time. Would you bow your heads for our time of prayer and invitation? Let me ask you that question. It'll remain up there. What is expected of you? Our Father in heaven, this is your word, and this is your message, and this is your mission, and this is what you've called us to be and to do. Every church is called to the exact same thing, whatever that's uh, Matthew 28 or Mark 16 or Acts 1, we know that we're to be witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost. We have the power in the Holy Spirit to proclaim the word of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us the ultimate example, the ultimate model that we can follow of laying everything down. And thank you for the word of God that speaks to us from Acts 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 and on and on for the model that we have to follow. I pray for this church. I pray for us collectively, and I always I pray for us individually. We will get a handle on what you expect of each one of us. Work in our hearts during this invitation time, I pray in Jesus' name. Please stand.